So first question, and I guess because I'd like to ask so many questions, um, it would be better for us to not go into great detail on each question, but just answer it. You can skip it if you don't wish to ask, answer it. Um, all four of you can answer it. Whoever wants um, can answer it. I guess for each one, um, I'll just let you decide. Do you want to go in a certain order or you want to just speak freely? Mm -hmm. I'm fine to speak freely, I think. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Is this Jeopardy? Is there a button we can yeah, hit? Yeah. Like <laughs> or is this like, <laughs> or is this dancing with the stars? We have like these boxes and we, and they light up the box or something. All right. So here we go. The first of 50 questions. Number one, um, Dr. Furman, last night you mentioned something about our weight and its correlation with cancer. So if someone's eating a whole food plant-based diet and they're doing great, but they weigh 170 pounds um, and their ideal weight should be 155 pounds, does that mean that even though they're eating a whole food plant-based diet, that they should be focusing on cutting the fat or eating less to get down to 155, meaning that both people are on a whole food plant-based diet, but are you saying the one that weighs 15 pounds less would have a lower risk of cancer? You could all answer this. Um, the quick answer is yes, that body fat, when, when a male's body fat starts to inch up above 15% and a woman's body fat goes above 25%, we start to see more insulin resistance, more prediabetes, more pro-inflammation coming, more, more um, interference with the immune function, and we start to see increased disease risks. And it's usually due to two wrong food choices, not, it's usually not eating too much because they can eat more, still eat a lot of food and eat foods that are, have a lighter caloric density, more vegetables, eggplant, asparagus, artichokes, they can still eat a lot of food, but it's usually making wrong, the wrong food choices that leads to that, not, not a person eating perfectly. Usually when you get their diet right and they get them eating a good assortment of natural plants, they don't have to restrict portions that low and they can still keep their weight more favorable. So, um, so yeah, I do um, advocate nutrient density in the cells and reduction of toxic waste in the cells. And the body works best with a high phytonutrient exposure in each cell. And we do that by modulating our diet to be as favorable as possible, to as much favorable foods as possible to achieve those kind of results. So it's, it's suspicious that this person probably could do a little better job if they're still 25 pounds overweight. I think that was beautifully answered. Uh, the only thing I would add is that to, uh, to focus on the true meaning of whole food plant-based. If the food that the person is consuming is truly in a state where you could recognize it growing in the garden, or cucumbers, beans, uh, kale, um, it's mostly fiber and water is what those foods are botanically, chemically. And and that's, that is a great liberation because if you go back for a third bowl of vegetable soup, who cares? It really doesn't matter. It's all fiber and water and it sloshes through you and, the, and you poop out the fiber. Um, it's when you start adding the, 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 the very nutrient dense foods, you don't want to eat you know, eight avocados a day, but also when you, I heard whole wheat go by. And so once you put flour products into the, into the food stream there, that changes a lot. Um, the, uh, the sugars in the flour are, uh, um, are uh, absorbed more rapidly, greater insulin response. It's harder to burn off your own fat if there's a lot of sugar in your blood from, uh, from the flour products. And also uh, to hold that whole wheat uh, bun together, the whole wheat bagel, whatever it is, there's, there's usually a, there's a fat involved. The, the flour would just fall apart. There's some fat. There's a Shortening in commercial baked goods, there, there's a shortening. It's egg yolks. It's uh, but in the vegan world, nut butters, etc. Well, once you get that fat sugar combination going, and uh, and and uh, you take a bite of the vegan donut or whatever it might be, uh, and the fat and sugar enter the blood at the same time, the body says, "Hmm, sugar, fat. Ooh, I'll burn that sugar now. It's easier to burn. I'll store that fat for later." And that fat-sugar combination is really notorious for really piling on the weight there. 
And when you pour oil on your pasta, you're creating that fat sugar combination. The, the almond butter and jelly sandwiches, you'll burn the sugar in the, in the jelly and the bread, you store the fat in the almond oil. So, um, so I suspect if you really had that person bring in an honest food diary for three or five days, you'd probably see the foods uh, uh, that are keeping them heavy there. And you want to break up those fat sugar combos, you eat them separately. And, and But keep their belly full of whole vegetables and fruits, and the weight will come down. And, and just, you? Go ahead. Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Matt. No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, no, I was just going to add, that's the thing to jump in. Um, I was just going to add that, um, to be clear, as, as Dr. Furman had mentioned, it's specifically excess body fat accumulation, so not necessarily just weight. So, for example, if somebody's a bit taller, then for them, a healthy weight might be a little bit higher than somebody who's shorter and, and vice versa. So I just didn't want someone to come away thinking it was all just specifically about weight uh, because things like muscle mass and bone mass and everything play into that as well. Um, and one thing that we could point to to um, really hone in on the fact that obesity or, or um, excess adiposity specifically increases risk is bariatric surgery. So surgery that leads to weight reduction also lowers cancer risk. And that's usually, I wouldn't say necessarily always, but often associated with, you know, not really a huge significant change in, in diet quality. So people just end up eating less, they lose fat, but they still have a lower risk of, uh, of um, certain cancers. And, and the other thing I'd like to add is I, I found it really interesting. Um, you're, I know, all aware of Roy Taylor's work and his uh, latest study was called Retune. And, and one of the things that it brought out was the personal fat threshold. And so even people with a normal BMI um, may actually be overweight, even though we would consider them normal weight. So they may be storing excess uh, fat in their liver, their pancreas, and even a, a small loss of five to 10% of their weight can lead to like a 40 to 80% reduction in, in, in the hepatic and, and um, pancreatic uh, fat levels. And so for some individuals, especially if they, you know, their, their BMI is normal, but they tend to hold a little extra weight in their abdomen uh, area. Uh, sometimes they actually need to lose weight even though they're normal weight. And we see this so often in Asian uh, populations, they might have a BMI of 23 and be overweight. Uh, so this is just something to be aware of. Uh, it can make a huge difference. You can, you can um, improve insulin sensitivity markedly by reducing these fat deposits in these organs. Okay, if someone says, I saw your lectures, I read your books, and I am totally, I'm totally in. I'm going to eat a whole food plant-based diet all the time, just like three or four days a week. I have eggs in the morning. Is that, and you know, and obviously they want to, they do not want to increase their risk of a disease, um, but they would like to include eggs four days, four, you know, two eggs four four days a week. Um, is this a big deal or is this not that big a deal? How, how should they think about eating a healthy whole food plant-based diet? but also adding in eggs in terms of disease prevention. It's a bad idea. Uh, why in the world to, to start your morning off with the two big gloms of, uh, of the most concentrated uh, collection of saturated fat and cholesterol on the planet? Uh, that's going to head for places uh, that it shouldn't, like the visceral fat stores and your artery walls. Um, and uh, the fried albumin and, and the egg white, uh, uh, probably not friendly stuff either. It probably in, increases IGF uh, production by your liver. Uh, it's a bizarre thing to start your morning off with. It's strictly a taste thing, a comfort food thing. Good heavens, there's better stuff to eat than, than two eggs. Uh, and uh, we can talk about, you know, some it elevates the risk of this, this, and that from all the saturated fat. Uh, but basically, it's time to change the person's uh, taste. You know, it's either oatmeal and fruit in the morning or even the, the just egg stuff. You know, if you have to have an omelet, I'd rather it be pea protein than uh, than uh, true egg, egg products there. So I'm not a big fan of two eggs in the morning, uh, to say the least. And I think they're increasing their risk for a, a number of uh, medical problems.
Um, I, I'd say that there are two really critical things to consider here. One is the dose and two is what you're replacing it with. So for one, if you look at eggs versus meat, and, and there are studies that essentially do that comparison, you see that eggs are healthy. Um, so if you're replacing things like bacon or sausages with eggs, that's a better choice. But if you compare eggs, especially daily consumption with plant protein sources, the plant protein sources win out every time for things like cardiovascular risk, all cause mortality. Now, would I, you know, extend that to like one egg a week or something? You know, probably not. But if we're talking, you know, two a day, three to four days a week, that's about one a day average. That is about where we see risks um, start to accrue, especially if it's consumed in place of plant protein. So I'd say the plant protein sources still win out pretty handily there.